Okay, this is from print textbooks to e-textbooks, navigating the transition with relative ease. My name is Jared Dees. I'm the digital publishing specialist at Ave Maria Press. Um, I manage our e-textbook program as well as our e-book program and, and do a lot of our uh, online and website activity. So we organized this website today because we've been getting a number of questions about e-textbooks and what's possible, um, what we offer, what students and, and teachers can do differently in this new um, uh, environment that we're in. So what we're going to do today is talk a little bit about what teachers can do differently, or how teachers have, have done are doing things differently. I'll start to share some of the tips that schools have shared with me, some of their challenges that they've come across, some of the, the tactics that they're using to overcome those challenges. Then I'll go into um, the, one of the biggest problems, which is just format and, and platform and devices, and, and how do I, I already have someone asking that question how do you address this problem of, of universal universality of, of different platforms and different types of, of digital resources? So let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. O oh my God, strengthen me with thy strength. Console me with thy everlasting peace. Soothe me with the beauty of thy countenance. Enlighten me with thy uncreated brightness. Purify me with the fragrance of thy thy ineffable holiness. Bathe me in thyself and give me drink as far as mortal man may ask of the rivers of grace which flow from the Father and the Son and the grace of thy consubstantial co-eternal love. Amen. That's a prayer by Cardinal um, Blessed John Henry Newman or Cardinal Newman um, from a new book called Heart to Heart. So you may have heard last week an interesting tidbit of news. The Encyclopedia Britannica, after 244 years of being in print, announced that they were no longer going to print the books of the encyclopedia. So that source of knowledge, the source of information that, that most of us use um, for reports and research assignments as growing up, is now lo no longer in print, no longer as books. And this is an interesting little ad, I thought, from the National, Ge National Geographic magazine from 1913. It says, when in doubt, look it up in the Encyclopedia Britannica, the sum of all human knowledge. It's just really interesting how things have changed since that time. And now that we have probably the most popular source, and actually the source of these two images, um, Wikipedia and Google, Google are now dominating the, the way in which our students learn, the way in which we learn. Um, it's just a testament to the changes that, that have been made to the way that our culture um, exists. And, and of course, this filters into the way we have um, all kinds of publishing, including um, educational publishing and e-textbooks. So making that shift from digital textbooks, um, from print textbooks, it, it comes with a lot of challenges. First, I want to talk about um, the challenges from the teacher's perspective. And then I want to talk about the school in general, to tr troubleshooting the, the challenges of, of becoming a one-to-one -one program, and then why we decided to, to focus, at least for this next school year, on a PDF site license. So first we'll look at the, the need for great pedagogy. So the theme that, we'll, that I'll be touching on a lot is the fact that um, technology isn't going to be the, the ultimate solution. It isn't going to automatically um, engage students. You still need to be a good teacher. Um, in fact, technology is only going to make you if you're already a good teacher, it's going to make you better. But if you're a bad teacher and you're using bad teacher, teaching methods, then it's only going to get worse. So it's never been more important to be a good teacher and to learn um, the most up-to-date teaching methods to, to implement into the classroom. Second, we'll look at the troubleshooting the challenges of, um, on kind of a technical end, the one-to-one -one program. What are some of the things that schools have noticed, especially those who've switched this year? Um, we worked with a number of schools who have adopted e-textbooks this year, and, and a lot of them were unexpectedly met with with some of the some questions that they weren't weren't um, looking for at the beginning of the year, um, and, and so I'll so share some of their experiences. Um, and third, we'll look at the PDF again. Um, why PDF is currently the best solution and and how it works. I got a number of questions, I, just three emails yesterday and and some this morning, uh, about what we have to offer and why we decided to offer things in the way we do. So I just wanted to clear that up and, and explain from a publisher's perspective and also a school's perspective um, the different options that are out there and, and what some publishers are doing today, including us. So you know, if I was doing this in front of a live audience, I would, I would ask you to raise your hands. How many of you used this? 
piece of technology in your teaching career, and maybe some of you still are. This is actually the, the first uh, tool that I used in, in my teaching career uh, was the overhead projector. And um, I remember the days of smudged marker and, and um, stained hands with the, 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 the overhead projector marker um, and the transparencies, the constant organization of transparencies. So teaching was done in a certain way with the overhead projector. We, we would write our notes for students to copy. We'd fill in the black line masters, or, or we'd make some of our own transparencies. We could show and critique some, some overhead copies of students' works. Uh, we could make tests or copies of the tests uh, into overhead transparencies and, and project them in front of the screen. Then not long after that, we had this amazing device, the LCD projector. And teachers started to make hundreds and hundreds and thousands of PowerPoints. And, and PowerPoint seems to dominate, even today, the way that teachers teach. Uh, certainly, you can show movies and, and talk about images as well, and projecting them in front of the screen. And even more recently, you have a combination of these two tools, the, the almost ancient overhead projector and the newer LCD projector. And combine the two, what do you get? It's a smart board. And I, I know one group of people are watching this presentation on a smart board. Um, it's unfortunate when the smart board is being used just as a kind of a glorified LCD projector. There's so many great things you can do with the smart board. Um, just the same things you can do with the overhead. And also, uh, beyond PowerPoint, you can use um, the smart notebook software uh, to create some even better presentations. If you go to our website, AveMariaPress.com slash tech tips, there's a couple of videos there I've made of, of using, kind of upping your game a little bit with the smart board. So check those out if, if you can. Um, I've written about this a couple different times. There's just some great things you can do with the smart board. Please don't use it as an, as an LCD projector. Do, do some of the fun thing, things that you can do. Um, but in some ways, I may be kind of speaking to the past already because not long ago, this device, the iPad, came out and, and certainly changed the way um, educators dream of it, education and, and teachers are, are teaching in the classroom. But there's a big question mark about how to use this device. And even if you are still a, a laptop or a PC tablet school, um, how, how to teach in a one-to-one -one environment is something that more and more schools every year are, are looking into. So I'm going to start by giving just five quick and easy ways to teach the, in a one-to-one -one tablet or one-to-one -one laptop program. This is for those teachers who, who are kind of anti-technology, who think they couldn't possibly change the way they're teaching. These are just some quick things you can do um, to, to implement the one-to-one -one iPad or one-to-one -one laptop programs. So one thing is a five-minute research project or five-minute research assignment. Uh, pose a question, have the students spend five minutes researching the, the question or the answers in their textbook. They can use the search function in the e-textbook for answer. They can Google their answer and find some websites online to, to research the question you might ask. This, of course, means you're, you're going to need to come up with some really creative um, questions for the students to spend the time researching. Um, th this is the kind of fast-paced um, environment that schools uh, with the one-to-one -one, um, one -one -one program can, can implement. So after all that, you can have some little fun with it. You can post answers to the board if you have a, an Apple TV or um, if you have an LCD projector or, or a smart board, even just a TV in general uh, on the board. You can post those things to the screen and then discuss them. So if you're using like a Google Docs or some other kind of a shared environment, they can, they can post their answers there. And you can just read them and talk about them as a as class. One thing that I think all the teachers that, that have implemented this one-to-one -one program have, have picked up on is the need to check make, to make sure the students are focusing on the assignment at hand. So um, you can call this a number of different things, screen check or, or flip. Um, basically, when, when you're in the middle of a lesson, you may want to just check to see, make, to see the students are focused on the task at hand and just without warning shout screen check or, or flip or whatever it is that the call sign would be to make sure they're showing you your, their screens to make sure you know that they're following along with the assignment. There's also some other technologies out there that allow you to, to kind of spy on the student's screens to make sure you know what they're doing at any given time. Another thing, this, again, this is about being quick and easy. Here's a 20-minute, um, just having students create 20-minute presentations. Not 20 minutes to present, but give them 20 minutes to do some fast-paced, quick research um, and, and summarizing of maybe a reading for the night or an, 
or some other assignment, or maybe if you gave a lecture, uh, give them 20 minutes to put together a presentation using their laptops or using their iPads, um, and, and put together a five to 10 minute slide presentation uh, in under 20 minutes. And then share those presentations with the class if you have a projector or, or an Apple TV device, or um, they could email them to you. You could pick two or three of the best ones that, that do the best job of summarizing uh, the assignment. Surveys and polls, there's some, some easy tools to create this. Um, Google Docs is one, uh, the forms function in, in Google Docs. SurveyMonkey, eClicker is an app that's out there. Uh, basically, you, just, you can create a survey, and then since all the students have mobile devices or laptops in their hands, they can take the survey, respond to kind of an open-end question, um, and then you can discuss their answers and then give maybe the actual answer or go into a little bit further uh, discovery of what the answers might be for, for a loaded question, a bigger question. I just share the link, the students respond, and then you can discuss the answers. There's also some great mind map. So most teachers will be familiar with mind mapping. There's some great mind mapping tools that can be used for in a tablet um, device or a PC device or, or laptop device. You can just summarize readings or lectures with these kinds of things on the iPad, iThoughts HD, uh, MindNode, Poplet, are some of the apps that are, are for cost in the App Store. MindMeister is free, but it actually connects to a MindMeister account, which is not free after a certain point. Simple Mind Plus is a free, but there's also a, a paid version. And there's also some mind mapping software out, out there for PC and Mac. These are usually web apps. Uh, free Mind is one you actually download. MindMeister is a uh, is one that you access online. I think Gliffy and some others are out there that some teachers are using. So that's just five quick ways. These are, are easy things to do. If you can see, if you look back at the things, they're, they're really focused on student learning. And that's the big, basic benefit of having a laptop or one-to-one -one program, is just being able to focus less on you as a teacher, but more on the students and keeping them active and engaged in a fast-paced manner um, throughout the day. Some other opportunities you could have for some long-term assignments is digital storytelling. There's some great uh, visual apps and visual things you can do to just tell stories this is just great for religion. Uh, image editing and drawing for the visual learners. You can compose music. There's some great iPad apps for create, creating music. And for some of your musical students, they can create or compose some, some songs that connect with the lesson of the day. If you're talking about uh, a certain story in, in the Bible or a certain story of church history or even one of the sacraments, this is a great opportunity to apply what they've learned to, to creating music. You can also Skype with an expert or, or use FaceTime. Um, I've heard also some other teachers who are spending some time at night FaceTime and Skyping with students. So when they have questions, if since they all have their devices, their, their mobile devices, they can just quick call um, at certain specified hours and ask questions rather than uh, trying to problem solve with their parents or, or trying to just get so frustrated that they can't finish the assignment. So I'm just going to pause for a minute. Again, if you have any questions so far as I'm going along, uh, go ahead and enter them into the questions section of the, the GoToWebinar dashboard. I have a bunch that came in before we started, and there's also some more coming in as we go along. Um, but take a minute. If, if you have a question, go ahead and ask that now, and I'll come back to it towards the end. Next, I want to talk a little bit more about transformation of of using a digital textbook. So we talked about some five quick, easy ways. But let's talk about e-textbooks specifically. Textbooks in general, or people in general learn in an active way. So some of you might be familiar with this cone of learning, which basically says that we, we only retain, after two weeks, we retain only 10% of what we read, 20% of what we hear, 30% of what we can see, uh, in, in other words, visual learning, 50% of what we hear and see, 70% of what we do, and then 90% of what we say and do. Now, regardless of, of the specifics of the, the percentages, the idea here is that just reading alone isn't going to get the job done. We can't expect our students to just read the textbook and answer the questions and then um, learn everything we want them to learn. We need to, as a teacher, um, supplement that with different learning styles. We need to get them, get them to be more active in the learning process. So the idea here is to move from, from a passive to an active learning environment, and then a one-to-one -one program, a one-to-one -one laptop or one-to-one -one iPad program allows the teachers to really to hone that um, need to be able to give students the opportunity to create. But looking back specifically at a textbook, if you're using an e-textbook program, we want to move from 1 to 10 here in this scale. 1 is just reading 
and then all the way to the end just is, is content creation, is teaching others what you've learned. That's the most active way to learn. And all of this, from reading on, requires the teacher's influence. You, the students need teachers to help them learn how to read. You know, reading strategies or reading skills are very important for um, success in life in general. So highlighting is something that students are very poor at. Make sure as a teacher you can teach students what to highlight, how to highlight, what, what to focus on in a text. Because otherwise, you'll have an e-textbook, and there'll be lines of different colors and, and highlights that are all over the place. Well, have a system that you can share with them and help them develop their own systems of highlighting effectively. Um, also, allow them to take notes effectively, making sure they're not just reading and highlighting, which is, again, pretty passive, but moving that into more of an active um, form of learning, which is taking notes. Again model this. And, and by the way, this is one challenge that schools have shared with me that have iPads, is you can't split screen uh, from an e-book to a, uh, a note-taking app, note application. So you have to kind of jump back and forth a little bit, um, which is why a lot of students have resorted to just taking notes by hand, uh, which we'll talk, come back to that in a little bit. Some of the things you can do is pre-reading, both uh, the, the headlines and the um, subsections, but also the images itself. Um, giving the students the opportunity to listen to an explanation. We'll talk about that a little bit in a minute with flipping the classroom. Um, encourage students to make comments and connections. If you're, they're having devices in their hands with technology, they can start to make comments and connections um, within their e-textbook programs themselves, within their e-readers. They can respond to questions there and then share them with you. Um, they can read and discuss with other classmates online. They could go to a, maybe a message forum or, or something else that you've set up on, on an LMS, like a Moodle or a Blackboard, that they can go there and discuss some of the assignments. And finally, you just want to get them in, into the habit of creating after they've learned something. So two of the most popular ways that teachers have done this, and this goes, on, this goes to that more active learning experience, is something called cooperative learning. And also, a very popular term lately uh, is something called flipping the classroom, which we'll go over real briefly. So cooperative learning, there's four kind of dimensions that I'd like to suggest that you use as a teacher. One is, is clearly define for the students the goals of an assignment, the roles that need to be fulfilled, and the procedures for creating the, the output or whatever it is you're going to collect, or, or how they might operate as a group. So that's the responsibility of the teacher to do that. You need to make sure that they understand the goals, the roles, and the directions of the procedures that they need to follow. Second, you need to give students the opportunity to communicate. And of course, they could do this in, in class, but they can also do this at home, maybe through a Google Doc or message, message boards or even through their social networks uh, if, you, if you feel like embracing that. And also for the students, they need to start creating something. This is a great opportunity for devices is being able to easily create together or alone a, a video or a presentation or images or all kinds of other things formats to show what they've learned as a group. And together, both teachers and, and students need to evaluate. You need to evaluate clearly the clearly defined goals and roles you described at the beginning by, by having a rubric or some form of, of assessing um, not only the end result, but also how well the students work together. And give the students the opportunity to assess themselves, being able to process how the, the group activity worked, um, what they can do better next time. Um, and that sort of thing. So these are important steps for cooperative learning. Uh, this is, the idea here is that you're assigning a longer term project, giving them time to work on it in class, giving them the opportunity to work on it at home together. Um, they don't even have to be in the same room if they have busy schedules like most students have today, traveling from sport to sport or club to club. But they can communicate um, with each other through the technology and that's how they can create their, their assignment. Something else that's been very popular lately is something called flipping the classroom. Flipping the classroom is essentially taking some of the things that we used to assign it for homework and bringing them into class and taking the things that we do typically in class and having students do them at home. So in other words, you're moving from a home experience of reading the assignment ahead of time, doing the homework, working on projects and getting parents help, to doing the homework in class or just doing work in general in class, having students watch a lecture uh, at home, and working focusing more on projects and cooperative learning in class so that students can ask questions and teachers can help directly the students and be, be coaches and mentors within the classroom. So essentially, this is, a, this is probably a common way that we think of 
learning and teaching today is here's the, the students, they're watching the teacher in front of the room. Well, it's a switch from that to the students coming up to the front of the room with the teacher and, and learning together. Again, teachers in front of the room, switching to a more student-focused form of learning. So flipping the classroom is a focus on student learning, student-centered learning. Homework is done in class and lectures are done at home. Students get one-on-one -on -one help from the teacher that they act more like a coach or a mentor or a tutor. It really allows for differentiated instruction. So each student can move at their own pace and they can really focus on a mastery learning. So a big portion of that is, is actually creating your own lectures and recording them, and uploading them in a format in which students can watch. And I've already heard some teachers share with me some good experiences with this. They can record it with some free software called, this is all online, Screener or Jing. They can upload them to YouTube or Vimeo or Google Docs or even directly to their Moodle or other LMS system. So the kids are watching the lectures at home and they're coming into class already prepared for the lesson of the day focus can be more paid on to the actual assignments or projects that they're working on um, that require some critical thinking. So an example of this for a religion class, they might, they might read an any textbook and, and fill out a directed reading guide at home, um, then watch a pre-recorded lecture explaining some of the contexts in the e-textbook. So some of the reading would be explained and supplemented by you, the teacher, um, in a pre-recorded video. And then in class, when they come to class, they fill out a graphic organizer that helps bring out together what they've learned in both the book and the lecture. And then they work in groups to apply what they've learned by further research and content creation. And I know a lot of you were thinking, this is kind of what I was thinking early on when I heard about this, is, well, this is easy for math. Students can complete problems in class, and of course they need that kind of one-on-one -on -one assistance from teachers. And it's easy for for science teachers because, hey, they can just do more lab days and, and spend, spend more time exp learning by experience. But what about theology? And my, my, initial, my first suggestion would just, would just be to take some of the strategies that are working well in your social studies classes if, if other teachers are using in social studies. Um, these are popular terms that you may hear, have heard. If not, go ahead and spend some time researching them. Um, classroom debates and discussions is pretty obvious. That would be a great way to, to um, apply what students have learned. Problem-based learning and discussion-based questions are important. Compare and contrast, role-playing experiences, and creating and publishing presentations, um, again, which, which we've talked about already a little bit. Some of the criticisms of flipping the classroom that are out there, and some of you may be able to share those with me, those of you who have been doing it already. But the idea, that some of the things I've heard is basically you need to make sure you're not adding too much more homework. Students are already bogged down with a lot of homework. If, if you're giving them a reading assignment and assigning a, a you know, 10 minute lecture, you know, that's, if they have to watch 10, minutes, 10 minute lectures for every class, it's going to be hard for them to keep up with the assignments. And the other idea is, well, what, if, what happens when the students skip the homework? They don't watch the lecture or they don't do their reading. And they come to class and they're, they're behind, not because they don't understand, they're behind because they just didn't do the work. They weren't held accountable. Uh, what are the students doing while they watch the videos? You know, multitasking is, is an unfortunate thing that many teens do. If they're watching the videos and on Facebook and texting all at the same time, they might not be as focused as they would be in the classroom when you're lecturing in front of the room or, or, or discussing some things in front of the room. And also, you want to be careful about some of the videos you're showing, making sure that they're relevant to what they're learning in class and, and maybe what you're teaching as well. And finally, one thing I've heard is the, the difference between the focus is still on deductive kind of learning. In other words, you're focusing on a concept and then talking about experience, as opposed to focusing on experience and then pulling out of that experience a concept. Um, maybe that's pulling hairs, but essentially that if this focus is still on listening to a lecture as opposed to experiencing things yourself, um, that, that can be one criticism. So that's all I have for, for the, from the teacher, teacher's perspective. If, if you have, as a teacher, any questions about um, some of the best tactics or strategies for teaching that I may have missed or some questions you might have a little bit. Um, I, I'm trying to go quickly so that I can get to the other two, three parts of the presentation. Um, most of the questions I've received actually weren't about the actual instruction themselves because you know, teachers who are good, again, are good teachers already and, and they're able to think of really creative ways and, and think outside the box of, of how to implement e-textbooks, how to implement one-to-one -one programs. Um, but I really want to focus a little bit on most of the questions I receive and most of the challenges that I hear, not so much the, the teaching but the actual technical side of things. What happens when you switch to a one-to-one -one environment? What happens to the school, to the culture? What happens from a, a technical 
um, perspective. By the way, I've heard a couple of people have asked this already. But yes, that we're going to. Uh, this is being recorded right now, so we will share this recording after the presentation is over. We'll, we'll upload it to uh, YouTube and Vimeo to make sure you're able to to view it at a different time or share it with some of your colleagues. So some of those challenges that I've heard this year um, of school from schools that are switching to one to one, um, it really was spectacular how many schools made that switch, made that transition this year. Um, Probably because of the iPad, about 80% of the schools that we worked with this year in our e-textbook program are iPad schools. So most, even the ones that are one-to-one -one laptop, are switching from the one-to-one -one laptop to a one-to-one -one iPad environment. The, the first in question that, or first challenge that I hear and have heard from almost every school, is bandwidth issues. That schools weren't prepared for the amount of pull on the servers on the on the internet. When you switch from a, a computer lab maybe accessing the internet to every one of your students accessing the internet almost simultaneously at the same time and constantly through, throughout the day, your system's going to be shocked. So it's really important, I've heard this from every school, to make sure you invest now. If you're switching to a laptop program or an iPad program next year, make sure your IT people are, are spending the time and that you're investing the money in the necessary um, framework so that the the hard wiring to be able to handle all the wireless access to the uh, the programs that they have. So uh, just be sure and do that right right off the bat. A, a lot of one story is one, one diocese completely the whole all the high schools in the diocese which made the switch hasn't had didn't have internet at all access until the second semester. So they went a whole semester without any access to the internet because of that um, vast amount of pull or vast amount of push maybe on the bandwidth on the actual uh, internet servers. Second thing I've heard is this: the slowness of maybe a school-wide adoption. Um, a, a few different schools have told me this. So, the, the, if you're going in with freshmen and, through seniors all adopting at the same time, the freshmen tend to pick up on using the devices um, exclusively much better than the juniors or seniors. The juniors or seniors still resort back to writing notes by hand, and there's nothing, there's of course, nothing wrong with that. Um, but you can just see um, when we talk about digital natives, how using the device early on can really impact the way that people learn. Excuse me, the way that people learn all four years. So, um, one challenge is just working with students to be able to use the devices to their full potential, especially the older students who are maybe set in their ways, um, but, and just giving them the tools to be able to use the devices in a practical, effective way as they move beyond um, high school. Um, a survey done recently of, of college-bound students were that 17% of college-bound seniors have tablets, and of course two-thirds or a little bit more of them that have iPads. So making sure that um, those who are not adopting it and using the devices are able to use them effectively. The other thing to be, to be sure to do is be clear right up front with the costs and to really do your research on what it's going to cost the school to make the switch. If you're not only making the switch to buy the devices, but also the other things that come with it. So the e-textbooks, for one, um, and how that's going to affect the model that you have for buying books, buying educational resources, uh, building in cost for apps. Um, I've seen some, some really good uh, sort of kind of Q&A or, or frequently asked questions on different schools' websites and on how to make sure. And th so just good, good models for sharing what the best way to pay for devices are. Some schools are asking teacher or some schools are asking parents to um, buy the, the devices themselves and then taking away the e-textbook or textbook charges. Some schools are building the, the cost of the devices into their tuition um, or just making up a kind of a new category with a, a technology fee. So do your do your research, contact some of the other schools around the country that have that have done this already uh, and make sure that you're clear right up front with the parents so that they're not at all confused about uh, what they need to pay for and, and what's uh, if they're buying devices on their own, what kind of device they need to get. If they're buying things off of eBay, they need to make sure that they're buying, um, if it's an iPad, and making sure you're buying the iPad 2 if you're requiring iPad 2s or the new iPad that's now out. The other thing is uh, formats, platforms, and devices. And this is what I want to get to, into next. Um, now that we're into this e-textbook world, the digital world, um, because of the, the way businesses are run, 
Many different formats have been created for e-textbooks. They're not universal. There's lots of platforms for accessing the e-books themselves, and there's lots of different devices. Each one of them are different. Each person has their own preferences, and it poses a number of challenges, not only for books in general, but for e-text or for textbooks, because textbooks, as you all know, are, are very different books than other kind of um, novels you might read. There's lots of images. There's lots of things in the sidebars um, that just don't work as well in the kind of flowing text that you'd see in a Kindle or a Nook book. So this is, this is, what, this is not an ad. I just want to kind of preface this by why I'm, I'm talking about the PDF. Um, this is what we kind of settled on, at least for this next school year, on the best solution for the schools that we work with. And we've had some great feedback from a number of schools uh, and that this is the most versatile way for them to access any textbook is basically we make a site license, we make a contract with the school and give the PDF to the school for a one year with an agreement that at the end of the year they're going to take the books off of the devices or at least require the students to do that. So why did we come across, why did we come down on a PDF which seems kind of silly, it's not even, some of you might say well PDF's not even an ebook, it's just a, a PDF, I've got PDFs all over the place. Um, well, hopefully this will help explain why that is the best option right now and why the schools have I found it to be most versatile. So the challenges, again, are, are in format, platform, devices, and, and distribution. So just, I want to give you a little background about the way that publishing works and why you might be hearing some frustrating things from certain publishers, not even just in the Catholic world, but also other publishers like the, the larger ones that have um, d different kinds of e-textbook programs. Well, why did we decide on a site license? Well, originally, publishers would um, create a textbook and sell the book to the distributor. The distributor would, would in turn sell the book to the schools and the schools would distribute the book to the students. So, so the student gets the book from the school, the school gets the book from the distributor, and the distributor gets the book from the publisher. But as you know, uh, or probably know, each school purchases textbooks a little bit differently. So some schools buy the book directly from the publisher and the student pays fees or maybe from a distributor, and the student pays fees to the school as a part of tuition, or maybe a book fee, then returns the book at the end of the year, and then the school recycles the book for the following school year. And a number of schools have bookstores, virtual bookstores, that are run by distributors or in-house bookstores uh, that the student pay directly and then resells it back to the store, or maybe sells it on, on um, Amazon or eBay somewhere else. Or some schools have gone to the model of just asking the students and the par parents to buy the books themselves um, on Amazon or wherever they can get it the cheapest and then reselling it at the end of the year um, however they might want. So this makes things a little bit more complicated but not quite as complicated as the e-textbook world. So uh, we, we sell directly to schools, we sell to distributors, and we sell to online retailers. So students get books in different ways um, regardless of, of kind of how we get books out. But for e-textbooks, things get a little more complicated um, because of format and because of devices. We create an e-textbook. What we've decided to do is focus on direct working directly with schools only for now because we can control the format. We know the format is PDF. We know what the experience will be for the schools working with the book. Whereas if we work with the distributor, um, and we've, we've done this a little bit, we can't control the format. We can't control the, the device. And, and that causes lots of problems. We have a lot of schools that that went with a distributor, went with an e-reader, and it, it didn't work as versatilely in every different school. So it becomes a challenge for us to make sure that we can control the quality of the experience of the book, and, and it comes a challenge for school to make sure they can manage the different types of formats and different types of e-readers that, that the students are using to access the book. We also um, aren't going with an online retailer like an Amazon because of uh, re reasons I'll explain in a minute, which has their own formats, their own e-readers, in which schools could access um, or students could access the books. So why PDF, which is again a kind of a simple solution. Um, one is this, this is a actual, actually a survey of college students. When they were asked what feature they liked most about e-textbooks, um, the biggest one was search. And this is something you can do with the PDF pretty easily. You can do highlighting, you can do copy and pasting just like any other e-textbook, e-reader might have. The interactive study guides and quizzes uh, would not necessarily be there, but certainly could be added in a, in a supplemental way by the teacher. So this is kind of the, 
the environment, or this is the way that the e-textbook atmosphere is, is existing right now. You have in orange a number of different formats or file formats. You have um, the third level down with the Course Smarts, Explanas, and Vital Source, Cafe Scribe, all these different um, distributor platforms for accessing e-textbooks. Then you have the very bottom, um, the many different devices that we work with or that the schools have that, that work with us, the laptops, the MacBooks, the iPads. Um, some schools have even asked students to go with e-readers like Nooks and Kindles. And the, and the kids also have smartphones. So they want to be able to access their books in different ways. Um, the, the challenge for us has been how do we make sure that they can ask, access them, um, all of the, the students, not just ones with iPads, not just ones with laptops. How can we make sure that that, that experience is good, that we can control the design of the book and not lose out on the images that we've spent a number of time researching and putting into the, the books themselves for educational purposes. So the first solution that we looked into and that a lot of um, publishers have looked into, and this works pretty well in, in the college market actually, but not as well in the secondary market in schools, especially Catholic schools, which operate a little bit differently than um, say a public school, which works with um, publishers in a little bit different ways. So it's based in XML. So, th so these different um, distributors have apps, either web apps or maybe um, laptop uh, downloads or iPad apps in which students can access with their devices um, an e XML version of the book. And usually that means the design of the textbook is consistent with what we've created, but not always the case. So this is what you might hear with CourseSmart, which actually is, is not something that we can work with because they focus on um, certain publishing partners. Um, we initially had a partner with, with Explana, which is now called MBS Direct Digital. Vital Source, uh, Cafe Scribe, and other e-reader platforms are also out there. And we haven't shut completely the door, the door to this option, but we just found that, that the challenge is making sure that the, the experience is the same for both a laptop school and an iPad school. And some of these um, e-readers weren't able to uh, get the, their e-readers up and e-textbooks up in the iPad platform, which to us has been one of the most important reasons to, to focus more on PDF this year. Another thing is, is the app. This is an expensive solution, but, but a solution in which the students, we would be able to maintain the, the e-textbook design or, or maybe just the text only. Um, but the problem with this is it would only be available on the iPad. So if we created an app, we wouldn't be able to have our schools, that, that our laptop schools, access it. Some of you probably heard about the, the recent Apple announcement, which is exciting for teachers, exciting for us as well, about the new iBooks platform, the new iBooks author, which allows um, anyone with a Mac to create an e-book, an e-textbook, and put it into the App Store. And it allows the kind of interactivity that we're all excited about, that we're all looking for, integrating video, integrating slideshows of, of, of pictures, integrating modules and things that we might have, might have had in those old CD-ROM days. We can put those actually into the book themselves um, and into the hands of students who have iPads. But that's just the problem that we have is that the time that we invest in creating something like that is going to reach the majority of e-textbook schools, but there's still those schools that have laptops and MacBooks that are, that are going to continue to do that that are left out. So it's exciting. Um, we wouldn't be able to just export the book as it is. We'd have to change the design because of the, the, the change in the, the text. So student, you can make the text shrink or, or get bigger and then kind of maintain a little bit the images that are embedded into the file. But the challenge then again is we have to create essentially a separate new book and we don't know necessarily how many schools are actually going to adopt that kind of program. But we're experimenting right now. We're creating some experimental chapters just to, to test on teachers and test on schools to see what they like the best. Mobi, for those of you who don't know, that's, that's the Kindle platform. That's what Amazon uses as kind of their proprietary form of e reader of ebooks. Um, the problem with that for us as an e-textbook is we can't have the design in integrated into a Mobi file. So we would we'd have to have text only. We would lose the images that which are very important for educational purposes and of course um, important for student engagement. So the other problem is it, it's only accessible through Kindle devices or Kindle apps, which of course you can do on the laptop. Um, but we don't want to, to sacrifice the design of the book for that. The standard form of, of ebook 
uh, ebooks are, are essentially e EPUB, which is growing, which is actually improving lately. Um, EPUB 3 is coming out soon, which will give some, some new opportunities for integrating kind of the interactivity, that, which we're all excited about. But as it is, again, it needs to be a, a new textbook. It's not going to have the same design. And, and for now, EPUB only offers um, text only, at least until the EPUB 3 is going to be um, upgraded. Mo in, including all of the images and sidebars that we have is a very different experience in an EPUB version of the, the textbook than it is in the actual printed textbook. So again, we want to maintain a consistency there. But again, the problem, of course, is it's not going to be as readily available on the laptop or MacBook. Um, there are apps you can read an EPUB on, but it's a little bit different than, um, again, the experience of the different devices um, that are e-reader devices or tablet devices. So the reason why we've gone with the iPad, or excuse me, the reason why we've gone with the PDF is because we can consistently be confident about the experience um, on a laptop or an iPad or even a Kindle Fire or a smartphone that, that students can access the book in its original design um, with the PDF. Now this also leaves out kind of the, the Course Smart Explana uh, vital source groups for now. Um, because we want to work directly with the schools, we want to make sure we can maintain the experience um, and, and not have to troubleshoot kind of the technology of it, that we can't control, the e-readers and the devices that we can't control. And most schools have been pretty satisfied with this, especially the iPad schools. Um, most of them, but not all, not all of them, are using an app called Good Reader. It, it's the best PDF reader app, at least that, that I could see, and according to most schools, it allows you to do all the things that, that you'd want to do in an e-reader. Um, highlight, uh, take notes, you can underline in many different colors, you can really easily and quickly access uh, a PDF or a file just by putting a URL in. Um, it's really easy to do. It was just recently in, in PC Mag's, PCMag.com's list of the best 100 iPad apps of 2012. It was ranked number 14. So it's a really good app. Um, but there's also some other ones that are free. This is, I think, $4.99 in the App Store. Other ones are out there are called the Notate, I think. Um, there's Adobe has one now. You can read a PDF in, an, in, an, in the iBook app as well. Um, but this is, seems to be the best one with the most the, the best experience. One warning: a number of schools noted that sometimes pages will be missing when students open the books. Um, but if you restart it, the app and, and open it back up again, they'll they'll be restored. So once schools have, have jumped on board and they're in, into the PDF option, I, it's been interesting to to work with schools because each one does things a little bit differently. When we give them a PDF file. Getting them to the actual devices is something that the IT people need to kind of figure out for themselves. They could bring in each device and physically upload the PDF to the computer or to the iPad. They can put it on their server, which is there in the middle, um, somewhere that, it, that is hidden from um, accessing to from Google or anything like that. So it's a, it's a it's a private way of accessing the file. And literally every school I've worked with has done things a little bit differently. Some have used Moodle, some have used Edline or other learning management systems like Progress Book. Some have used Google Docs in kind of a, an innovative way. Some have used Dropbox or equivalent programs like Dropbox. Um, one school which is using a, a, still using an, a one-to-one -one laptop program and, and continue to be using a type of program like that is using Microsoft Share, SharePoint. So there's a number of different ways for you to get the PDFs pretty effectively to the uh, devices. And I can work with the IT people on that if there's questions that you might have. That's it. So I, I see a number of different questions, but if, if you have some more, we have about 15 more minutes. So if you have questions that you'd like to share now that I didn't address quite yet, uh, go ahead and send them in. I, I'm going to come back to a lot of the things that people were asking before. Um, if you have questions either from a teacher's perspective, how you can start to implement uh, effectively the devices in your classroom, if you have questions from a school perspective, go ahead and ask those into the, in the GoToWebinar questions section. Or if you just have any comments, I have a couple of things that people are sharing about their experiences, which are great, and I'll share those with you in just a minute as well. So let me pull up the questions here. Excuse me. Uh, one person asked, how do you assess the success of making this transition? Um, a couple ideas I had were just basically, so how do you assess the success as a school? Uh, one would be to survey the students, to survey their experiences and, and the parents as well. Survey the teachers and how well they actually use the devices. Um, if you're an administrator going into the classrooms and just 
seeing what the teachers are doing a little bit differently, something to, to monitor. Now, I would measure, pick up some metrics and that you can kind of assess the, the way in which um, teachers might do things differently so you can go in and check those off. Assess some of the technical difficulties, like I mentioned the bandwidth problem is a big problem that most schools are having. Check into that, making sure that you are prepared when, when launch day comes, when the first day of school starts, were you able to manage the number of, of requests on the server, um, how many devices were broken, how many um, need to repair, how many had um, issues with technology, how much time were you spending, teaching not only the teachers, but also students and parents, training them on how to use the devices. Those are kind of some of the things I would suggest right off the bat uh, on measuring the amount of success next year or in the coming years. Um, some people were asking about interactive textbooks and, and what you might need. Um, Flash is, uh, they even mentioned Flash or Shockwave. That, that's one thing that has caused the biggest problem with as far as universality is that, which is probably a good thing actually, that, that iPads don't allow you to access Flash. So a number of e-readers were based in Adobe um, platforms, including Flash. So the iPad, you couldn't use the iPad to access um, the books, or you had to access them through a web app online, and if the internet went down, you didn't have access to the books. So, um, so the iPad, no, in the future, it doesn't seem like there's going to be a problem. The, the EPUB 3 um, language that you can use to create textbooks. This is down the line. It's not quite even approved yet. Or even the iBooks platform offers a number of opportunities for interactivity that won't require any extra kind of download. And then the problem there is, of course, that um, you might be limited by the device that you have. So a laptop might not be able to do the same kinds of things that an iPad can do. A couple of general questions about how, from, from experiences of the schools, how has it impacted student learning? You know, the biggest thing I've heard is just that the engagement goes up because um, I think naturally the students stop focusing on um, presenting um, from front of the class, but start focusing on using the devices um, more intuitively, and the students get really engaged. When, when you stop having to, f to feed information and you start giving students the outward, opportunity to ask questions and learn for themselves. It's kind of a whole new ball game. So um, as long as the teachers can keep up with that kind of creative type of learning, it really does seem to have a great great impact. And also some of the other kind of general tools that are out there, just continuing to use those, um, filling out um, documents uh, as worksheets and that sort of thing, still apply. I should mention, as before I answer some more questions, if, if you have some more questions that, that aren't getting answered here, or if you want to set up, even if you're not switching next year, you just want to kind of explore your options or troubleshoot a little bit, shoot me an email at jds at nd.edu, and we can set up a conference call either with um, your school or just in general with the, the textbook coordinator or even the theology department chair. We can talk a little bit about what to expect, what you can do in the years to come uh, to prepare for this shift. Um, I'd love to do that. I, I talk to schools pretty much weekly, so I, I have a, a number of different questions I've heard about all of them, um, and we can help you kind of problem solve or, or at least start to dream big about what you can do in the future. Let's see. I have a question about grants available to iPads or related device for students. It's kind of interesting. Apple in the, in the past, um, Macs kind of grew in popularity because of their programs that they had in schools. They were able to... Um, Get, schools were able to get grants and get access to MacBook or I'm sorry, um, Macs to put in their the libraries. Um, I know when I, growing up we had mostly Macs in our our library computer labs, um, but it was kind of unfortunate. The most recent Apple announcement about um, didn't offer any solution for schools to get the actual iPads themselves. So Apple itself doesn't offer any kind of um, grant, but there there are some grants out there. You can certainly um, do your research and, and apply to grants, especially if you're a Catholic school. Um, don't don't think that you don't apply. You don't you don't apply for uh, those kinds of grants. There are certainly grants out there, and as long as you can and make your case in, in a meaningful way to maybe just even experiment with certain classes. And I know some schools have gone just one classroom or just one grade as an experiment. Yeah, look out there, find those grants and, and those private donors that might be interested in helping you out. Scanning through some of the other questions. Yeah, again, we're recording the presentation. We'll make sure to make that available um, after this. 
This is other resources about in-service and teachers. I'd certainly be, be willing to do this again for some of your other schools or some of your dioceses if you're interested in doing that. Uh, we can work out that as far as an in-service program to help train with the devices. Interesting. So one of the a school who's who's using iPad. This is they did a little survey. They said, fifty four percent of students prefer printed copy and forty six percent preferred use of an iPad two. Um, if they were going to write their answers out, more, more preferred the digital book. And about sixty seven freshman students. That's really interesting. So uh, about half of the students prefer iPad, and about half of the students prefer to continue to write out things by hand. Um, and that's in a freshman classroom. I'm guessing in, in the older grades, it's going to be even lower for using the actual book, just because they haven't been used to that. So, yeah, thanks for sharing that, Patrick. That was that was a great, great comment. Um, what is the average space size for an e-textbook? Um, I think for our PDFs, they're, they're like eight megabytes, uh, something like that. So, um, it, sometimes it becomes a challenge depending on how your, your school decides to get the books, get the files to the students' devices. Um, some programs, I think Progress Books is one of them, that we, we struggled a little bit to get, we had to break up the file to make sure this, the kids could get the access. So um, yeah, it's about eight megabytes, and most of them are about this, they're all about the same size. Um, somebody has to, asked, do I have a list of one-to-one -one schools that, I don't have a list, I, I, have, I have a list of schools that we work with. Um, one thing you can actually do is kind of interesting, just, Go to Google and type in Catholic school, Catholic high schools, or Catholic schools, and and then something like one to one or or laptop or iPad. You'll find a bunch of news articles because they pop up all the time. Look for some news articles and then just contact the diocese or contact the schools that you might be interested in talking with. What type of equipment is most popular in the classroom? If you have the iPad, the Apple TV is a really cool device that a lot of the schools that have switched over have really had a fun time with. That would be a, a cool thing to use. Um, other than that, I mean, just making sure you have a projector. It's, it's a great way to integrate with the uh, the one-to-one -one, uh, devices. Another question, what, what grade levels are digital text most popular? Most of the schools we've worked with either they do, if, if it's there, they switch. So, so they go with whatever. They're, if they're switching just freshman next year, they'll go with just the freshman books. If they're going all, all out with all the schools, they'll get e-textbooks for all their courses. So I'm not sure if there's a necessarily a grade level that's most popular, but depending on how the school is implementing the program. Do you have any plans to move over to another platform in the future? Yeah, we're certainly open to that. I think we're just kind of watching to make sure whatever we go with is the best use of our time um, to be able to create the the book itself or the e textbook itself and to make sure that that all the schools would have access to whatever we create so yeah we're constantly learning constantly talking to different other companies and you know this is this is different for us because we really have to rely on other organizations other companies we have to be better at working together within in house on, on creating a cool and uh, effective device or effective types of content so um, yeah we're, we're learning as fast as we can we're, we're in some ways, um, relying on other people to make some headway on uh, platforms as well. Somebody asked about the data. So I was quoting 80% of the schools. I'm not sure how many schools, Catholic schools in general across the country who are e-textbook schools or one-to-one -one schools have switched to the iPad, but I do know that, um, again, about 80%, a little, probably a little bit more of the schools I worked with this year are iPad schools. And when I get phone calls and emails on a weekly basis, um, the vast majority of them are switching to an iPad, not for the first time going to laptops, um, uh, which has just been really interesting. Yes, yeah, so here's a great use of Apple TV, and I, I mentioned this a couple times from, from again from Patrick. Thanks again, Patrick, for for sharing your. Um, experiences. It says the thing that has become so slick in my room has been to have the Apple TV connected to an HD TV and to have a special YouTube channel. Now the students don't even plug in an adapter to their, their iPads. It all just works. We have done iMovie Player projects, which is great by the way, um, which we loaded within the class period in the YouTube channel and, and easily available to one uh, all, all in one classroom. So, so great experience, Patrick. Thank you for sharing those. And if you have some more, yeah, keep them coming. Which you are, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, 
you know, somebody made a comment based on an earlier statement. Was I suggesting that they should you should make the shift maybe one year at a time or just all at once? You know, the schools that I've talked to actually. Um, the ones that I asked that question, most of them said just to jump all in, and not to just go one year by year by year, but just do it just to do it all at once. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the reasons were behind that. I think maybe it's because it becomes easier for the teacher to know exactly because if you know, like like most of you and, and I was teaching, you teach different grade levels. So if you're teaching a freshman course um, with iPads and you're teaching a junior year course without iPads, um, it might be kind of a challenge for you as a teacher. And uh, it just kind of changes the environment in general. So I think a lot of people have had some great experiences with just jumping all in, um, but certainly testing the waters has, has its benefits as well. Um, most of the schools I've talked to, though, seem to be making the shift all at once, just jumping all in um, and switching completely. Somebody asked, can you integrate iPads with a smart board? Um, I was looking at that recently. Yeah, definitely you can. Uh, there's some cool apps out there too that that allow you to uh, really control that. You can connect if you're close enough to the kind of a the the, the wire. There's a connector. I think it's like twenty nine dollars to get the connector from the iPad to um, like a general projector or a smart board, and then you can write on the the iPad as opposed to writing on the board. You can just do that pretty easily. And like I said, there's also some apps out there that allow you con to connect it. I'm pretty sure that the the um, what is it, the Promethean boards, the, the ones that are more Mac specific, those have some easier connections to be made through the iPad, but I may be wrong about that. Okay, that, I'm pretty sure that covered most of the questions. If you have some more questions, like I said, um, go ahead and shoot those out to me right now, or uh, send me an email again, and we can we can set up a time to talk. I'd love to, to just brainstorm a little bit about things you can do, and and again, uh, just talk about some of the options that are available for you, and and go from there. So, thank you all so much for for bearing with me in this presentation. I hope it was helpful and informative. Um, it's been about an hour now, so um, again, this is an exciting time to be in education. I'm excited for all of you as teachers and schools, um, and I look forward to to working with most of you on on making this transition. So so thank you.